And it's often you cannot with dry and ace, as you can see on Astrid's top. So dry and ace again is what we are there. And the top that Astrid is wearing is called Titan top because it's a little bit flirty in the fabric. You can see that the patterns are actually little stones and gems. And um, this is a detail that just everyone wants. It's beautiful for little girls, very pretty little girls at the moment. Okay. Um, even for me, sometimes it's difficult to to explain. That makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I still don't see myself as a designer. Um, sewing is one thing, and designing is another thing. And I started with sewing, and I'm merging into into a different area, which is which is designing. But to me, designing is I'm, I, I feel that like my skills are still behind. However, and having said all of that, I do enjoy fashion and I do enjoy textile um, from different parts of the world and I do enjoy colours, which is my passion for colours, I think, stems from the fact that I am Caribbean. Um, and I do enjoy beautiful clothes. So my aim is to inspire people uh, with their fashion choices and their textile choices. Definitely these days, I think it's very important to think very carefully about the fabric we choose and, and, and why. Um, something to do with mood and the five senses and, and, and all, all that kind of stuff. So I, want, I do want to inspire people by my own sense of fashion. Um, and so at the moment, I coach people a lot on their fabric choices, but also their sewing, sewing technique. Um, I'm currently coaching someone who's launching a um, um, luxury collection. So I do a lot of consultancy for them. And I will I also do a lot of um, consultancy with people wanting to make different choices with their fashions. Okay, that, that triggers a question in my head. So for example, I'm not exactly the most fashionable person in the world, but and. Yeah. I, I, I kind of like a cop out. So, for example, as you can see, I'm wearing black and blue. Mm. I wear that because I just think it's easier to maintain. Like, for example, I've got dark coloured trainers on as well. Yeah. So I think that's easier to maintain yeah. than white. Do you, you mentioned the five senses. Do you think that the colours that people wear on a daily basis have an effect on, on the person itself? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's, for example, the happiness effect when it comes to colour. There's a particular colour, yellow, for example which as soon as you see yellow, you wear yellow, it triggers a sort of a sense of happiness in you. Now, when it comes, you know, fashion and styles are two different things. Not everyone has got fashion, but everyone has got their own style. And style is to do with taste, and taste is your first, your first senses. So you have the eyes, the ears, the nose, the taste, and the, I forgot the other one, and the touch. Mm -hmm. Now, taste, in your style and taste in your fashion is the first sense that you actually express. So if I see you, this is your style and this is your taste. And that's absolutely fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. And you know, it, it, and it's fine. And then, but the other thing is, if you see a fabric with flowers, are you gonna instantly think about something that smells nice? Hmm. Right? Or the other fact is some fabric, leather, denim, have got a smell. Some people like that smell, some people don't like that smell, and therefore will never wear it. You also have fabrics who, have, who make noises. Think, for example, of a bride. She is in a beautiful big taffeta dresses and she will walk down the aisle. That fabric make a noise it will swish when she walks. Okay. And that, that swish noise will make her feel heard, seen and magnificent and you know, all of that. And it, just, it will just create that illusion of, for her anyway, of, of grandeur and luxury and that kind of stuff. So I think, yes, those five senses can 
trigger different mood in people. The other thing I'm going to say is if you, if you go fabric shopping or clothes shopping when you're unwell, let's say your nose is blocked and your, your vision is blurry and you, 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 you are ill, you're not going to feel the same way. And you probably will pick something on that day and then look at it two days later like, okay, when you're feeling better and thinking, why did I choose that? Hmm. Because you're going to touch it differently, because you're going to see it differently, because your, 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 your vision and all of that is, is sharper then. When you bought it, you were like all weak. And so you probably look at it and say, why did I buy this? Mm. It's not going to resonate with you anymore because you are in a healthy state, state of, of mind. mind. That's really interesting because I never, it, it, it's a normal thing. It should be, maybe it's because we live in such, a, maybe because I live in such a busy society, I don't, and I haven't been conscious of it, but it's, it just relates to the fact in order for you to do your best work, you've got to be sound of mind and you've got to be, the two have got a line, a line yeah. in order to create a piece. Now, I'm not a creative or something like that, but I guess so, because it's going to cloud your, well, it's going to cloud your judgment, but you know, yeah, I know it's, I kind of, like, it just makes me think a lot about what you just said. That's really true. Um, Can I just say one more thing as yeah. well? One last thing on, on that very topic. Yeah. Clothes that we wear are the most intimate things against our skin. Mm. Think about it. What's between your skin mm, and nothing, that, to be honest. that it's that's it. It yeah. is the most intimate touch mm -hmm. you have every day from the moment. So I think that's why it's so important that we and obviously if if you wear tomorrow a t shirt that is a bit scratchy, you're gonna feel you're gonna feel awful all day mm -hmm. because you're gonna feel against your mm -hmm. skin. So all of those things are I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. How did you actually enter this field what, what what made you want to enter it or was ah. it just something um my mom used to make our clothes when i was younger so i've always been around so, a sewing machine and i've always seen my mom making our clothes so i've always took an interest so i knew how to use a sewing machine very very early on mm -hmm. never had one until seven eight years ago maybe when i thought well this is ridiculous i know how to use a sewing machine i needed to do one project and i was about to go to a friend i said a sewing machine costs 80, quid, 80 pounds, I can just buy one. So mm -hmm. I bought a sewing machine just to fix that project. And then I never looked back from now on. And then I, I saw everything. And then, and then I went on to that TV show. And then, and then, then I realized that I had, a, I had a voice and I had something to say. Until then, I was just doing my thing. Like, you know, no one needs to know. I'm just doing my clothes and that's it. Um, and then doing, going on TV show means that I had to look at social media and people were starting to follow me and I was thinking, okay, people want to know then. And that's, that's how I, I, I went, you okay. know, I came to there. So you, you made reference to that TV show. What was that TV <laughs> show? I know exactly uh, what the TV show was about. Okay, so it's called The Great British Sewing Bee. Mm -hmm. So it's the same as The Great British Bake Off, but it is for sewers. Mm -hmm. It exists in France as uh, Cousuma on M6, and it's about people who can sew, and it's a, it's a, it's a talent show mm -hmm. where every week someone is eliminated based on the garment that they've produced. So I did apply for the show four years ago, four and a half years ago, mm -hmm. because I was curious to see how far my skills would take me. What I did not expect is I did not expect to make the, the cut for the last 10. Mm -hmm. So 3,500 something candidates, wow. the last 10, which is the best amateur sewer in the country. Mm -hmm. um, That's fantastic. That took me by surprise. I was not, <laughs> I was not ready for that. Now, now, so I was like, yeah, I did that. But at the time, I, I did not realize, I did not realize that I had something to say. Mm -hmm. I was just doing my thing. Mm. Now I know that I've got something to say. Oh, that's good. Um, what was the biggest challenge for you during the doing the B? In um, uh, I'm not English. Okay. It's, it's, it was the biggest challenge. I can speak English to, I think, a decent level. Oh, come on, you're having a conversation with me. <laughs> like, if it's not... <laughs> that, 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 but you never know. There's some more conclusion, you can speak English very well. Come I on. know, but and sometimes you... <laughs> there's a word or two words that trick me up. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, right. so if we were to do this conversation in French, how far would we get? With you, not very far. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. I can, I can speak English. I, I, I try my best. But it's actually what was the most difficult thing because 
I was very nervous to think, mm -hmm. am I going to understand everything? Am I going to understand the, the instructions? Am I going to make friends? Am I going to be able to sew in English? You know, all of this was my, my biggest fear. And obviously you are on camera and you need to speak on the spot and you need to show personality. And even though I did all the auditions and all the casting and camera and things like that, it was still on my mind. And it's actually exactly what tripped me up on the second episode where I was reading the instruction on what to do, and then I read it once, did not get that particular phrasing, and I read it again and started panicking, and, and, and it went downhill from there mm. because I could not understand step five or the, of in, in the instructions, and, and I, I, I did a very bad garment from that. So okay. it was my biggest fear or problem or issue. Or, like, yeah. what, what was your best moment, you would say? Oh, Plen plenty. Um, I didn't quite register what was happening when I did the auditions because in my head it was not happening and it was not real. But thinking back, if I try to remember, I had plenty of good moments there. Um, winning Challenge 5, I think it was, was a really good achievement because I had two objectives. Well, the first, well, three. The first one was to make the show, even though I didn't think I could, but I made it. The second objective was not to be eliminated first, and I did that. And then the third challenge I set myself was to win one challenge, and I did. So winning that challenge, when they go, they judge all the garments one by one, and then they're still not calling mine, I'm thinking, wow. And then when the last two, and then when they, they told me, and that, that was a really big one. And then there's the friends as well that I've made. Mm, that's brilliant. Uh, I was just thinking, you've lived a very young age in Paris. Yeah. You've lived in London, obviously. You've lived in Martinique. You've also travelled the world, been to different places in the world. What place in the universe do you feel has the most influence in your work? Or do you think you take a little bit of influence from everywhere? Martinique still has the most influence in me, for the colours, for the, for the, for the weather, for the food, for, you know, all those little things again related to senses. I think Martinique still has a massive influence on me. When I go home on holiday, I really look forward to that because I can just sit back, relax, and I know that things will come to me because I know that I will be inspired all the time by by what I see and the people I speak to. I feel that when I went to Martinique, I can tell that the, the, the dress sense was different to the English-speaking Caribbean in okay. terms of, I think there's obviously more of a French influence, but yeah. however, what I was thinking is when I went there, the Caribbean is more influenced by America now in yeah. very different ways. Yeah. Do you feel that Martinique's dress sense has changed in the last 20 years or so or do you think it's very similar to what it was like when you were growing up? I think I I'm not sure if it's going back to where I was the way it was when I was growing up but I think it's going back to probably my parents time in the 60s where it's all about the big prince and the, the African prince you know all those sort of um, what we call Robe grand mère or gold, which is you know very ample dressings, dresses and that kind of stuff. I think it has gone back a lot to that type of style, which I don't necessarily know because I was not born at that time. But when I see my aunties all dressed up and everything, that's what it reminds me of. It's gone, it's mm. gone back to to before. Mm. Ask about like your process, for example. What's your process for designing a piece of work or before you embark on a project? What, what things do you feel that you always need to do to make sure that you produce the best piece of work? I don't have such a process. What I, what I try to do is no matter what's going on in my life, I always try to find inspiration. And to find inspiration, then I, had, I have to look at what's around me. So I will make an effort to go to galleries and I'll make to, an effort to go to events and that kind of stuff just so I have that sort of constantly fresh mind of, of what's going on. But I don't have a particular process. I know there's things that I like that I, that I want to translate from 
art to fashion, which fashion being art, but there's actually a piece of art that I've created into pieces of fashion. And I kind of like, I do like that, that process. I feel like in this day and age, there's like blocks and it feels like people, are, a lot of people are wearing the same thing when you go out on the street. For me, I wanted to ask, how important is it to have more and more designers in terms of clothes? Because it seems to me everybody's wearing the same thing. I can tell when people are going to the gym, obviously you need to wear stuff that's obviously mm. you're able to do activity in, but it feels that people's, uh, people like Next, for me, Next and H&M, not calling out anyone, but I've said their names now, they pretty much produce the same kind of clothes yeah. in my opinion. And I know there's places that people could go and look for particular unique stuff, but how important is it to have designers in this day and age that are kind of outside the box? Ooh, um, I think this phenomenon of, of everyone wearing the same thing is a lot to do with sociology and anthropology. Um, and to where you live. So, for example, you've 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 named two 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 brands mm -hmm. or, or two retail retailers, Next and H and M. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put Zara in the mix, for example. Mm -hmm. So, if you go to a Zara here in the UK, and and they claim to you know whatever you are in Europe, they will all have the same collection at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's what they say. But if you go to a Zara in the UK today. And then you go to the same Zara tomorrow in Spain, which you know where they are, or I don't know in Germany, and you will see that it's not exactly the same. People don't. It's the same collection, if you like. Mm -hmm. It will be more or less the same pieces, but it will not be the same because they will put an element that will trigger that particular country. So there's a lot, there's a lot to do with soci sociology and anthropology and how people dress and how people make it a uniform. In anthropology, we say that um, we all have, so for example, if you like, if you look at places like Africa or South America and all those things, where they've, they've got very, very specific, not only taste, but cultural tradition when it comes to their fashion, the Western world would say, oh no, we don't have any of that. We, you know, we wear what we want and it's very, you know, it's very all, actually no, because there are things that, people wear in the Western world, like if I wanted to be really out there, I would still stand out and I probably would not be applicable to, to that country. So I think it is very important for to have different designers and for people to be, and it's not a requirement, people don't have to be, but it's good for people to express individuality no matter what the individuality is. If your individuality is what you're wearing, go for it because you know that's who you are but I, it would be nice for people to have a wider choice of things for them to express themselves as they are as opposed to uniform mm -hmm. and uniform is is helpful it's it is safe if you, everyone is dressed the same because you don't want to stand out too much mm -hmm. only the brave can stand out but you don't want to stand out too much but I think it's good for her to have different designers. Yeah. And don't forget, as I said, sociology and anthropology and what's going on in the world massively impact yeah. how people dress. Yeah, I really liked, and the reason why I liked it because it had a lot of detail. Recently, you made a dress for a contestant, if I'm not yes. mistaken. And it does remind me, you say that Martinique has a strong influence on your work. It yeah. does remind me of the dresses, some of your past work that I've seen as well. Like something like that, you take your influences, you take your influence from the Caribbean, do you take influences from anywhere else? And my other question is, how long does it take to make something like that? Because that looked detailed. Like I, I looked at the picture, yeah. and I, as you know, I'm not an expert in all yeah. this stuff, but it looked like each part coming down the dress yeah. had a lot of detail in it. How long does it take to make something like that? Because it looked like a lot of detail. I mean the the fabric the fabric itself I bought it as it is I didn't I didn't okay. I didn't do the whole you but know the structure it's the structure really... the structure it was a lot of work and it's very heavy to mm -hmm. manipulate it's not heavy to work to wear but it's very heavy to manipulate and very delicate um, that dress right so the first the first fitting I did for that dress was a disaster. Because it was too long, it was too big for her frame, and I had to start it all over again. 
and I had to start it all over again and I only had four days to do that. And I have a nine to five job, so I did it in the <laughs> afternoon, in the evening. Mm. So I would say, yeah, probably about three, four, probably no more than five to six hours, I'd say, to make that dress. Okay. But you're right, it is very, very influenced yeah, with you Martin. you can see that straight away. Mm -hmm. But it was actually for a pattern in the UK. Mm. And that's what crossed my mind. I thought, whatever pageant that little girl's entering, that dress is going to stand out because it's not, uh, it's not like the British kind yeah. of style. It's a, it's a very pretty, very... And you can tell, like, if I look at anything from St. Lucia, yeah. Dominica, Martinique, yeah. it looks like something from there. Yeah. And you can see it. And what, but where it fits in for me as well is the colour because the colours are, for me are more to near what British people would yeah. wear as opposed to the colours that you would see at a Creole Day festival or something like that. Or, that was very, yeah. very, very intentional. Yes. Now, that dress, um, so we went to the pageant. So her mum is from Martinique and her oh, dad okay. is from Tunisia. Oh, wow. Okay. So her mum wanted her to wear something. Reflecting her heritage. Exactly. And so we went to the pageant in Chester and that dress was for the party wear session of it. It's, I saw, it's so interesting you said that. <laughs> um, and so when she, when she wore the dress on, on the day, so she was changing between two things, then she wore that. And everyone around was like, wow, it's a beautiful dress. It's so unusual. And it is unusual for them, but it can still relate because it was that particular color and because mm -hmm. it was all pretty. And her mum, with all the reaction backstage, and when she saw her daughter in a dress, her mum was convinced that she would win first prize for that dress. To be honest, she should have. Mm -hmm. Because, right, so she didn't. And the dress that won was satin, beading, sparkly okay. dress on an eight years old little mm. girl mm. to us to me and to the mum and to me as a designer if you say party wear junior categories age seven to eleven mm -hmm. it has to be a girly lit a, a little girl's dress mm -hmm. not bd not satin which is very difficult to manage it's stiff Mm -hmm. That girl could run in the dress yeah. like wild. And that's what you're looking for in that type of age group, aren't you? Exactly. <laughs> she could run wild with mm -hmm. that dress, but she felt so pretty at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's what you want in, mm -hmm. a, in a design like this. Because you go to any wedding or birthday party, the children are always running up and down. Exactly. So. You're not going <laughs> to sit down thinking, don't run, you're going you're gonna to get your dress dirty. Don't yeah. And that's exactly what, mm -hmm. I was, you know, what I was trying to emulate. And she didn't win it. Mm -hmm. We're still waiting for feedback and understanding and why i mean it's fine she didn't mean it but uh, yeah i'm glad you you mentioned that and um, i'm glad that dress is standing out as a as a nice piece okay i just wanted to ask you a few more questions one was what are you is there anything that you're working on at the moment that people can see publicly uh, yes um it's not right now available but you will be able to see very soon the parvin madea collection Parvin Madea is of Indian heritage and she has created a collection uh, called East Meet West. So I, I have helped her design and I have made her sample dress. Um, with she, well, I was meant to go to Dubai last week, I didn't, but she, she did a photo shoot in Dubai with the first design of, of that collection, that dress that I made and she showed that in, uh, in the desert. It's absolutely stunning, and I cannot wait for everyone to see that. So that's going to be available. The, the collection will be very limited. She will only sell 10 pieces of everything, okay. but there's my work behind it as well. Okay. So that's coming up. There's, there may be someone watching this, or several people watching this, that are really want to do what you want to do. If, what advice would you give to them if they wanted to follow in your footsteps? I don't consider myself an expert, so I'm mm. going to go into my consultancy mode <laughs> <laughs> um, type of thing to say that. Um, really want to, you need to really know what you want to do in terms of where are you going to sit within the market, 
first of all, are you the female, male, or you know, and etc. And also, what is your selling point? They say so. Some people would say it would be luxury fabric, and other people would say it would be simple fabric. I actually prefer simple fabric because again, that dress was a simple fabric made beautifully. Um, but really, learn. There's a lot of information online. There's a lot of things online, and be brave. Don't don't hesitate to ask. Don't hesitate to try. Don't hesitate to cut. You're going to make mistake, and if you make mistake, it doesn't matter because you can only improve by making mistakes, about trying the first time. I've made a lot of mistakes before and I still make mistakes to these days. So don't be afraid of making the mistake, but you need to try and you need to try and improve your skills every single time. Don't stick to what you know. So if today you've learned how to do a zip, that's fine. Tomorrow you need to go and learn something else so then you can broaden your skills every single time. That's what I would say. This may seem like a very deep question. Me, you, the whole world, eventually we transition, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, we eventually transition. So my thing is, even if you don't transition, maybe in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you're still around. Yeah. What would, what would you like to be known for? What would you like to be remembered for? What would you like your legacy to be? And that could be life or that could be fashion and style. Um, life, I would say it's kindness and love and generosity, um, but also being, being open-minded. A lot of the stuff that are happening these days is because people are set in their own ways and they don't want to see past what they know. What we know is not it. There's, there's, more, there's always more to it. So I'd like to think that I've made people think in this way and there's more to life but fashion I'd say I you know going back to what I said a bit, a bit earlier luxury fabric can make a cheap dress a cheap fabric can make a luxury dress and I'd like to explore that a little bit more because eventually that would help the situation we have with fashion at the moment Cotton, for example, or linen, or that kind of stuff. Cheap or cheap-ish fabric can make beautiful fashion, which I think is more challenging and more interesting than the obvious luxury fabric to make beautiful clothes. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to do.